speaker up right now is from Monero. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we call him because he's known, on, uh, known by this handle online. Fluffy Pony, make some noise! Hello. So, welcome to the two hour deep dive into Monero. I hope everyone brought their notepad and paper, there will be a test afterwards. But seriously, what I'm going to talk about today is why people should troll more, or how to decentralize people. So I was going to actually spend 15 minutes talking about how, as you guys may have noticed, this conference has been full of a bunch of ridiculous ICOs, <laughs> making crazy claims about technology that they will never be able to build because they don't have anyone on their team that has ever built decentralized security software, but I thought that would be mean. So, instead, I'm Ricardo Svanyi. You may know me as Fluffy Pony on Twitter, or that guy that was really mean to me on Twitter that I blocked, whichever. And I'm gonna talk about decentralizing people, so I'm gonna chat a little bit about the current state of affairs, how Monero has tried to decentralize its people, its people, and uh, has this all been for nothing? So to start, let's talk about the current state of affairs and let's try and understand the threat model that we're actually facing. Because the thing is, if we can't even identify our threat model, then what's the point? What are we trying to defend against? So when dealing with decentralized applications, our threat model consists of at least five main actors, nation states, hackers, researchers, criminals, and the press. And all of these attackers, all of these actors can cause tremendous harm to a, a project that's trying to be decentralized. Of course, hackers and researchers and criminals are clear. Nation states, we understand how they can attack a project. And even the media, in their effort to go and uncover the truth, can end up exposing aspects of a project um, that might end up doing tremendous damage to it. So these are the people that we're defending ourselves against. Now, when it comes to the actual attacks, the thing that we need to remember is that attacks can be, and often are, firstly innovative. So, you know, it's more than likely an attack you didn't expect. Secondly, it's unexpected. Um, it's, it's, you don't have time to prepare for an attack, you know. No one says to you, hey guys, I'm gonna attack you tomorrow. And then it's resource intensive, so you can't always apply resources, whether it is financial or incentive, uh, technological incentives, to try and prevent attacks. And then lastly, most attacks, or not most, but plenty of attacks are counterintuitive. So you can't say, well, miners will always act in good faith because a mining pool can be bribed, a mining pool can be hacked, an exchange can be hacked and uh, its coins can be used to attack a proof of stake currency. So counterintuitive attacks are very common, surprisingly common. And we can't expect everyone to be a good, a good actor in the system. So we have basic goals that we're trying to achieve by decentralizing projects and by decentralizing these systems. Firstly, we, nobody should ever be able to control the network. If someone can control the network, we're not doing our job. Nobody should be able to easily introduce a back door. So you need many eyes on the code. No single person should mean the life or death of the project. And frankly, users depend on us getting this right. So we can't really treat this with uh, any sort of, um, you know, we can't treat it as a joke, this is serious stuff. And where the trolling comes into it is that the project should be respected despite the people involved, not because of them. Now, the reality is that ideology matters, and in fact ideology is just as important when it comes to protecting your project against attacks as technology. There's only so much that technology can do. If somebody knocks on your door at the middle of the night and says, well, you know, uh, he has a million dollars, please put this bug in the code tomorrow. How do you defend against that from a technology perspective? The truth is you can't. Now, how has Monero tried to do this and what can we learn from that? So, Monero, just to give you a bit of a primer how Monero started, in uh, April 2014, some guy called Thankful for Today launched Monero, not me, despite contra contrary to popular belief, and it was initially just a fair relaunch of the CryptoNote reference implementation, and then very early on, within a few weeks, uh, Thankful for Today ended up being a gigantic douchebag. And the community didn't like this. So myself and six others forked the project away from him. And we sort of lived in parallel universes for a time where we were both putting out releases. And after a few months, Thankful for Today disappeared. 
Now the importance here is that the core team who forked the project, our role is merely stewardship. We're allowed to exist because the community allows us to exist. And if we had to do anything untoward, then the, we can just repeat this process and someone can fork it away from us. So that's how Monero got started. But today it consists of a lot more, com or many more components and many more people. We obviously have the core team who are stewards, as I mentioned. We have the contributors to Monero, who are the developers, and over the lifetime of Monero's history, we've had about 330 people work on Monero and write code. And uh, over and above that, just in the past year, we've had uh, nearly 140 people work on Monero. Then we have the Monero Research Lab, which is an open group of academics and researchers. And we have the Monero community that do things like post on the subreddit, they build out uh, parts of the ecosystem, they help newcomers. Um, and then we have work groups, and work groups are self-assembling groups of people um, that come together and say, hey, it would be cool if Monero did more of this. It would be cool if we had a that. Uh, so as an example, there's the vulnerability response work group, and that work group is responsible for accept or taking in reports on HackerOne, um, or reports that are sent privately or publicly about bugs and exploits in Monero, and then evaluating whether the person uh, is reporting something that's legitimate, how are we going to fix it, how are we going to disclose it, whether the person gets a bug bounty, and so on. And all of these groups work, um, they're intermingled, but they're permissionless. No one needs to come along and say like, oh, I'd like to fill in a form to be part of the Monero Research Lab. You can pitch up tomorrow. The problem with that is that it leads to two major issues. Firstly, it leads to the challenge of personalities. So personality clashes, abrasive personalities, that sort of thing. And the challenge of paying the bills. How can people work on Monero if they're not earning money? So how do we face these challenges as a project? So let's start with the challenge of personalities. The reality is that there are going to be multiple personalities working on a project, and some of them are going to butt heads. So we encourage mutual respect, and in a technical environment, this is relatively easy, because technical people tend to respect other technical people. We also do nearly nothing in isolation if we can avoid it. We try and talk about how we're trying to achieve something as individuals and as groups. And this means that everyone in the community understands how we got from point A to point B, how we arrived at a conclusion as a community. And then we all we'll have problem children, every project does, and so you openly discuss the problem child and you hope that the problem child reads the discussion and self-corrects. If they don't, well, you encourage those who are unsatisfied to kindly fork off. And by fork off, I mean fork the project. Not fork your mother if you want fork. And then, of course, we don't limit platforms for discussion or communication. So we mainly have discussions on IRC, but we also have a Slack relay. We have a Mattermost relay. We have the subreddit. We have the largely abandoned Monero forum. Um, but we don't close things down prematurely uh, because we want people to use all of these different forms, whatever form of communication and interaction is comfortable to them. So how do we achieve the, or how do we meet the challenge of paying the bills? So the problem, of course, is that not everyone, especially newcomers, are crypto rich. Um, some people lost all their private keys in a terrible boating accident. I don't like to talk about it. So we achieve this with two, two main um, ways. The first is we use donations and crowdfunding. So general donations to the project, which then can be used to pay bills, it can be used to pay for somebody to do some work on Monero. And we have a crowdfunding system called the FFS, the Forum Funding System. And anyone can go and post an idea and say, I'm willing to do this, I'm willing to work on the Monero project and do this thing, and this is how much it's going to cost, and here are the milestones, and this is the cost attached to each milestone. And then the core team holds the, the money that's raised in escrow, and then pays it out when the community says, yes, this milestone has been met. Now the advantage here is that uh, we're not tampering with uh, miners, uh, block reward, or anything like that. We don't have a weird governance system. It's very basic, it's very simple for users to understand. And we've had massive raises. We've raised half a million dollars for Project Coral Reef last year. Uh, we've raised a whole bunch of other money to pay for two full-time developers, one on Monero and one on Cobri, and to also pay for two full-time academic uh, postdoctorate researchers that are part of the Monero Research Lab. And then secondly, we also have corporate sponsors. So we've had sponsors that are, uh, cover some of our bills, that um, give us access to some of their uh, software. Uh, and uh, then we have other people in the ecosystem that uh, benefit from Monero, like XMR.to, um, who uh, spend some time working on Monero because they're earning money from Monero's existence. So 
has this really been worthwhile or is this a massive waste of time? Well, let's look at some best practices. So the first thing is if you want to have some form of ungovernance in your project, you need to educate. So don't keep knowledge to yourself. The second thing is to welcome newcomers, make them feel useful. Make sure other people know how to do your job so that if something happens to you, if you choose to leave, someone else can take over. And then of course, you need to hand over responsibilities to others because at the beginning with any small team, with any small group of people, obviously things cluster and people tend to do a lot more than just one task. And sometimes you need to do less to give others a chance. So you're not the kid at the front of the class always sticking up their hand when the teacher asks a question. Let somebody else answer. And don't ever think you're irreplaceable because you're going to get a huge shock when finally you are replaced. And lastly, you always highlight the efforts of others because again, you're not irreplaceable. So what if you're just starting out? What if you're a new project and you want to decentralize as much as possible? Well, if you have a known founder, an identifiable founder, or a central company or foundation, well, you're largely screwed. Uh, but what you can try and do, especially if you're in the thinking stage, is think about ways to build this as a layer two system, whether that is a merge mine project on top of Bitcoin or Monero or whatever, whether that is a lightning app, whatever it is, try and build it out as a layer two system so that you're not wrecking the fundamentals and, and the incentive structure of that base chain and that you're able to do all sorts of fun things but without putting that base chain at risk. So, has this been for nothing? Well, let's take a look. Um, over the past few, uh, past, uh, few years of Monero's existence, we've noticed ideological effects as a result of this decentralization process. So Monero contributors know, first and foremost, we are responsible for securing people's money. That's a, an obvious one. But we also know that no matter how much I tell people don't buy Monero if you, unless you have a use for it, people aren't going to listen to me and they're going to go and, I don't know, mortgage their house and buy Monero. And so our code might be responsible to protect someone's life savings. But we're also aware that because we're a privacy enhancing project, our code might be responsible for an innocent person either going to jail or not. And lastly, we know that our code may mean the difference between life or death for an individual, for a user. And so with all this in mind, it's safe to say that any project, especially a privacy enhancing project, that doesn't treat their project and their user base with the same concern is not only irres irresponsible, but they're indistinguishable from a scam. Now, Monero has also seen incredibly, incredible commit growth. So in terms of not only the number of commits that we've had on a monthly basis, but the quality of commits, we've really seen a marked increase in it. Um, reviewers had a, have had a much easier time uh, over the past year because commits have really been well written and well, well designed. Um, and then also in terms of the number of new committers, committers and contributors, people pitching up and saying, I want to work on Monero, I don't care about being paid. That's also seen a massive uptick as time has progressed. But it's not enough. We need you. We need new people to pitch up and say, hey, I want to do something. I want to help Monero. I want to make Monero great again. Or, well, you know, I think it's pretty great in the first place. Um, and these are some of the things that you can think about. And I'm not going to go through them because otherwise we'll be here for another 10 minutes. But that's about it. And I'd like to thank you guys for having me. If you have any questions, we don't have time for them, but feel free to contact me via email. Unless it's about your ICO, in which case, please don't.